down here the burden is heavy and the road is rough and long sometimes our feet get weary as the storm but let's do this Nothing to be concerned about because it's all in God's hands. In fact, Amen. he's already there. Isn't that wonderful? I know who holds tomorrow.
62, 62 sheltered in the arms of God. LaVonda sings a beautiful song. She did it last Sunday, in fact, called Under His Wing, talking about uh, the sheltering wing of God. This song here says that I'm sheltered in the arms of God. What a beautiful thought. Number 62. John sings this song probably like nobody else. It's called Sweet Beulah Land. Choir, y'all are going to sing the chorus. I'm kind of Oh 
the light, I hear the singing, a brand new song of joy divine, my soul and downs with her health and it is so good to have her back she's got some strength back and uh, what a wonderful voice I, I love to sing with her and this is her favorite song we had a request from someone tonight to sing this song I listened to the preacher this morning trying to describe the crucifixion what our Lord went through even before he got to the cross how he was treated and it makes this song even more special because it says and the words are so true. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind, Judy. Isn't that, isn't that a, Judy was on his mind. Jerry was on his mind. So I hope you enjoy this. Thank Amen. you, Jenny. <laughs>
kind of a praise course it just says thank you Lord for saving my soul if you don't know it it's, it's really easy to learn maybe stand with us if you could
Amen. Well, welcome back to Sunday evening service. And let me remind you, I'll be gone this week. I'll be leaving early in the morning. And I'll be back for next Sunday, though, and be preaching on I Am the True Vine. And I'm going to have some visual illustrations next Sunday. And uh, this is one of those messages that's burning. And uh, I'd encourage you to pray. Be a good time to get your family and friends and neighbors and loved ones to church. Sunday school next Sunday. How many just love not going to Sunday school? Well, some of them must because they don't come. <laughs> uh, so let me encourage you to really Sunday school. Man, what a, what a wonderful opportunity to teach God's world Sunday school is. And let me encourage you to be in Sunday school. And uh, Wednesday night, Brother Charles. How many of you know Brother Charles? Uh, Brother Charles will be. <laughs> I wish I could say it like a good black man. <laughs> Brother Charles. He'll have Wednesday night, and I know he's got something good for you, so be sure and be here Wednesday night. And uh, next Sunday evening, we'll be on the hill at the Pavilion. Young Song will be with us singing, so. Let me encourage you to really work to good time to get your friends and families and neighbors to come out and be with us. Uh, Thursday, the choir is going to Bible Baptist service at seven. Vans and all will be here at the church to leave at six o'clock. And let me encourage all the choir to call the ones that's not here and just encourage them to be there because there's nothing more encouragement. Go do something for the Lord and nobody don't show up. And let me encourage you, really pray and encourage, call all the choir members and say, hey, we need you Thursday night at Bible Baptist in Elizabeth and Brother T.D. Burgess will be preaching. So, And then homecoming, old-fashioned homecoming. How many of you got some old-fashioned clothes? Well, just dress up in them. And... Somebody said, that's all I got is old-fashioned. So... Uh, and then some, uh, if you got some antiques, I was just thinking, uh, if somebody's got an old number 12 turning plow, how many of you know what an old number 10 tur turning plow is? Some of you? Um, and maybe some uh, things that we could display, bring that Sunday morning and set out. Uh, I think uh, Brother Jack's going to bring his Corvette. Every time he drives that thing makes me covish and envious at his mind. So, uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, old fashioned homecoming on the 8th of October. And as you know, we've already got Brother Clyde lined up for ribs and chicken. Man, he can cook some ribs, can he? And chicken. So we've got all that worked up for October the 8th. A week from Sunday, how many of you know what will happen a week from Sunday, October, I mean September the 10th? How many of you know? What, Jenny? Huh? No, they'll be here next Sunday evening. There's not one of you know. My wife's the only one. 11 years, the 10th day of October, I mean the 10th day of September, which was on Sunday. September the 10th, 2006, I became your pastor. So it'll be 11 years this coming September. Have you put up with me? I don't understand, but you have. All right. If our men have come, receive the Sunday evening giving you, give us. Where does time go? How many of you were here 11 years ago when I came? Hold your hand up. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. 11 years ago.
Brother Jack, would you pray for us? Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 8. Tonight we come to that of Abraham. We saw that of Abel, a man that worshipped God by faith. We looked at Enoch, a man that walked by faith. We looked at Noah a man that worked by faith. And tonight we see Abraham, a man, faith that failed, and a faith that succeeded. A faith that failed, and a faith that succeeded. Interesting study, the life of Abraham. Follow with me as I read verse 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterward receive for an inheritance. You are to circle that next word, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents which Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. How many of you know Abraham looked beyond this life and saw the new heaven and the new earth? And that was really what he was sojourning for after he met the Lord God Almighty. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us in the study tonight. Father, we thank you for thy word. We thank you for it. It is forever settled in heaven. And I pray, Lord, tonight that you'd help us to realize the importance of God's word in our life. And I pray tonight the Holy Spirit of God would illuminate our minds with the truths about this man, Abraham. And I pray we'll learn some deep spiritual truths tonight. And we'll give you the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Turn back to Genesis chapter number 12. Because in chapter 12 of Genesis, we first get introduced to Abram. To Abram. And his name is finally changed from Abram to Abraham. As old Mays Jackson says, when you get ham on anything, it makes it better. So he, uh, he got the ham on his name. There's a deep meaning there to that too. But where was Abraham at? You go back to the last part of chapter 11. Abraham was raised in the area of the era of the Chaldeans. This would be today modern Iraq. Abram was raised under heathenism. He was raised in a place where they had moon god and other gods and deities 
that they worship and all. But God came to Abram, and God spoke to Abram. How was Abram justified? Abram was justified by faith. When God spoke to him, he believed God and believed that it was God's grace and mercy and nothing that he could do unto himself to bring him in right relationship with God Jehovah. And when God spoke to him, you can find that in Joshua chapter number 24 and verse 2 about the place and the religion that was in Abram's life where he grew up. And God spoke to him and he said, Leave your home in the air of the Chaldeans, present day Iraq. He said, Leave your father and your relatives behind. Go to the land. The Lord, I will show you the land that I would have you to go to. Notice he said, leave your fathers and your relatives. Did Abram totally obey God? No. Who did he take with him? He took his father and he took his nephew Lot with him. Let me remind you, partial obedience will lead you to the wayside. And that's what happened to Abram. Abram came to know God. I believe with all of my heart, he is justified by faith. The just shall live by faith. I believe here in the Word of God that Abram was a, he, he put his faith and trust in, in God Jehovah. God justified him. He was forgiven. He was in right relationship. And God told him what to do. And Abram goes in partial obedience. Now learn from Abraham. By the way, Paul writes in the New Testament and says all the Old Testament is for our admonition and our learning. It would be wonderful today if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would become a student of the Old Testament. How in the world are you going to be a strong Christian? How in the world are you going to have a victorious Christian life, if you don't understand the foundation from which that you came and your faith is instructed and built upon. So God told him, he said, to leave your relatives. What did Abram do? He took part of them with him. Now notice in chapter 12, God makes some promises to Abram. He said, I will make of you a great nation. Yes, he has made of Abram a great nation. He said, I will bless you and I will make your name great. I want to ask you something. Is there any name anywhere in the world more prominent in in any religion than that of Abram or Abraham? He's the father of what? Judaism. He's the father literally of Islam. He's literally the father of the Christian faith. This man Abraham his name has been made great. And he made a promise to Abraham. He said, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. And I'm going to tell you something. If I had one ounce of Jewish hate in me tonight, I'd cut my veins and drain it out. I believe there is a promise from God. You be a friend of the Jew and pray for, for the kingdom to come for Israel and love a Jew I believe there's a blessing. I, I'm going to tell you something. I believe the nations that stand with Israel today, I believe God will help those, but those that stand against Israel, I believe there is a judgment of God that comes. And God promised Abraham another thing. He said, I promise you the land from the river in Egypt all the way to the Euphrates River, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, all the way up into uh, to Syria, uh, next to the Turkish border, all of this land is known as the promised land, and I make a covenant with you, Abraham, that this land will be yours. Can I declare something to you? That has never been fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled one day. The Jew will occupy all of that land one of these days. As I told you a while ago, Abram was justified by faith. Genesis 15, 6. If you'll just look at it, maybe you turn one page, you'll come to Genesis 
15, 6. Look at this. And he believing in the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him for what? How was Abraham made righteous? By faith, by grace, and not by law, or not by works. Now, Abram was a human like you and I. Can I get amen? amen? He wasn't perfect, and he failed. How many of you believe if man had wrote this book, he wouldn't have put all the bad things in it about people? How many of you know this is a book, this is a mirror revealing our stinking hidden secrets? It tells all the bad, and, and, the, and they ain't a one of us likes our dirty laundry put out there. And God is honest, and God tells it just like it is. So Abram was a man just like you and I. He wasn't perfect, and he failed. A journey of faith. You start in chapter 12, and if you'll read and study to go to chapter 22, you'll see a man that keeps growing and maturing in faith. You know what God intended for you when you got saved? God intended on you to start a journey of maturing and growing in your faith. He said, Peter rolled and said, His newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word of God. You're on the bottle as that young Christian. But honey, listen, if you've been saved 10 years, you ought not still be wearing diapers and sucking the bottle and, and eating pablum. You ought to have some strong meat. You ought to be able to come and pull up at the table and have a big old steak like my wife fixed for lunch. And fried zucchini and salad and iced tea and strawberry shortcake dessert. Now it takes a man to eat that. <laughs> You're not stay on the bottle. But the problem is today, too many people have got saved and never grown. Abraham started a walk with God, and yes, he started in partial obedience, but he started his walk. He started walking with the Lord. Now, Genesis 12, 1, God calls Abram, listen to the words I'm getting ready to say to you. He called him to separate himself from his family and from the heathenism that he grew up in. God knew now that Abraham has been justified by faith. He's his child, and God is calling him out to leave the heathenism that he's in and go to another land and start a new life. He left his country. He took part of his family, and all of a sudden he goes a distance. If you'll read on down in chapter 12, he goes to Haran. And what does he do? He pulls over and parks. Was that where God told him to go? What happened to Abram? He got sidetracked. I got a thought for you. Do you think our lack of faith and separation and obedience to God is holding back the power and the blessings of God on us today? God told Abram, he said, separate yourself. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something. I believe with all my heart God wants the church to be a peculiar people. And when I use that word peculiar, I ain't talking about coming in here with pink hair and, and uh, rings in your nose and your ears and belly, uh, rings in your belly button and all that other stuff. I ain't peculiar in the Bible. That word says that my people should be a peculiar people. It says that you should be a people that is living in the glory and the grace and the power of God in such a way it gets the attention of the lost that there's something unique about you. How many of you believe God's people ought to look, act, smell, and behave different from the lost world? You got your Bible hurley, go with me to a few verses. Romans chapter 12, verse number 2. Romans chapter 12, verse number 2. I know that you can start in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable of God, which is your reasonable service. But don't stop there. Look what verse 2 says. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and what? Perfect will of God. Conform means to what? To be in a mold. God does not want the church to be molded like the world. God wants the church different. Different. Look at another verse. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 verse 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen to what the Lord says to his people. What was Abram to do? He was to separate himself from the heathenism of where he grew up. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord what? How many of you believe it's time the church starts looking different, acting different, smelling different, behaving different than what the world does? God said, come out from among them. Look at 1 John chapter 2, one last verse I give you. 1 John chapter number 2. 1 chapter two. John chapter 2, verse 15. Listen to what the Lord gives us admonition to do. 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth for what? Forever. Folks, God said to Abram, stand up in your faith and separate yourself from your relatives. And, and that's a message that you and I ought to do today. What causes the world to get off track? What caused Abram to get off a of track? Abram partially obeyed God. He said on his journey, we don't know why he stopped in Iran, but we know that he spent a little over five years there. Why did he get sidetracked? Why did he stop there? I got a more interesting question for us tonight here at Oakland Avenue Baptist Church. What's caused us to lose sight and forget where we come from and where we're going? What's got many sidetracked today? What has caused the church today to get derailed? And by the way, listen to me tonight. Most churches tonight are decreasing and failing and not increasing. Now, folks, that ought to alarm every one of us tonight. I believe the Lord is soon coming. And I believe whatever you're going to do, you ought to stop procrastinating and you ought to get busy doing it. Listen, what caused the saved, the church, to get off track today? Maybe we have forgot where God found us. How many of you believe it would be good every one of us to go back and just think, where did the Lord find me? I tell you where the Lord found me in the gutter wanting to die, cutting die, wanting to live and cutting live. And I need to go back every once in a while and remember where the Lord, and by the way, I didn't find the Lord. The Lord came searching for me and he found me. And we need to remember where we were at. The condition of our lives. And I'll be honest, I don't think I, if I'd have continued in the life that I was living, I don't believe I'd have lived another 10 years on this earth. I believe somebody would have killed me or something drastically would have happened. I don't live, but think I'd have lived another 10 years if I hadn't got saved and changed my living. Maybe we've lost the fear of God. How many of you know there's very few people who got a reverential fear of God anymore? 
Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about a fear that my God's got a big old club up there just waiting for me to mess up and hit me over the head with. I ain't talking about it. I'm telling you something. I believe we ought to have a river. You know what? The fear of God will teach you, teach you wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How many of you believe you're living in a stupid, confused, mixed up world? One of the reasons nobody fears God anymore. A fear of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I got this fear. Not that God hates me or mean to me. I got this fear. By the way, it's a good thing. The fear of God keeps me from a lot of things. Maybe we've got sidetracked because we've become full of pride and we've lost sight of our need of God. 